Chapter 14, Part C of the Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume 1, by Giacomo Casanova. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume 1, The Venetian Years, by Giacomo Casanova. The moon was shining, and I saw a church with a house adjoining, a long barn open on both sides, a plain of about one hundred and fifty yards, confined by hills, and nothing more. I found some straw in the barn, and laying down myself, I slept until daybreak, in spite of the cold. It was the first of December, and although the climate is very mild in Corfu, I felt benumbed when I awoke, as I had no cloak over my thin uniform. The bells began to toll, and I proceeded towards the church. The long-bearded papa, surprised at my sudden apparition, inquires whether I am Romeo, a Greek. I tell him that I am Fragico, Italian, but he turns his back upon me and goes into the house, the door of which he shuts without condescending to listen to me. I then turn towards the sea, and saw a boat leaving a tartan, lying at anchor within one hundred yards of the island. The boat had four oars and landed her passengers. I came up to them and met a good-looking Greek, a woman and a young boy, ten or twelve years old. Addressing myself to the Greek, I asked him whether he has had a pleasant passage, and where he comes from. He answers in Italian that he had sailed from Cephalonia with his wife and his son, and that he is bound for Venice. He had landed to hear Mass at the church of Our Lady of Casopo, in order to ascertain whether his father-in-law was still alive and whether he would pay the amount he had promised him for the dowry of his wife. But how can you find that out? The Papa del Dimopolo will tell me. He will communicate faithfully with the oracle of the Holy Virgin. I say nothing, and follow him into the church. He speaks to the priest, and gives him some money. The Papa says the Mass, and enters the Sanctum Sanctorum, comes out again in a quarter of an hour, ascends the step of the altar, and turns towards his audience, and... After meditating for a minute, and stroking his long beard, he delivers his oracle in a dozen words. The Greek of Cephalonia, who certainly cannot boast of being as wise as Ulysses, appears very well pleased, and gives more money to the impostor. We leave the church, and I ask him whether he feels satisfied with the oracle. Oh, quite satisfied. I know now that my father-in-law is alive, and that he will pay me the dowry, if I consent to leave my child with him. I am aware that it is his fancy, and I will give him the boy. Does the papa know you? No, he is not even acquainted with my name. Have you taken any fine goods on board your tartan? Yes, come and breakfast with me. You can see all that I have. Very willingly. Delighted at hearing that oracles were not yet defunct, and satisfied that they will endure as long as there are in this world simple-minded men and deceitful, cunning priests, I followed the good man, who took me to his tartan, and treated me to an excellent breakfast. His cargo consisted of cotton, linen, currants, oil, and excellent wines. He also had a stock of nightcaps, stockings, cloaks in the eastern fashion, umbrellas, and sea biscuits, of which I was very fond. In those days I had thirty teeth, and it would have been very difficult to find a finer set. Alas, I have but two left now. The other twenty-eight are gone, with the other tools quite as precious, but dum vita super est, bene est. I bought a small stock of everything he had, except cotton, for which I had no use, and without discussing his price I paid him the thirty-five or forty sequins he demanded, and seeing my generosity he made me a present of six beautiful otargos. I happened during our conversation to praise the wine of Zante, which he called Genorides, and told me that if I would accompany him to Venice, he would give me a bottle of that wine every day, including the quarantine. Always superstitious, I was on the point of accepting, and that for the most foolish reason, namely, that there would be no premeditation in that strange resolution, and that it might be the impulse of fate. Such was my nature in those days. Alas, it is very different now. They say that it is because wisdom comes with old age, but I cannot reconcile myself to cherish the effect of a most unpleasant cause. Just as I was going to accept his offer, he proposes to sell me a very fine gun for ten sequins, saying that in Corfu 
anybody would be glad of it for twelve. The word Corfu upsets all my ideas on the spot. I fancy I hear the voice of my genius telling me to go back to that city. I purchased the gun for ten sequins, and my honest Cephalonian, admiring my fair dealing, gives me, over and above our bargain, a beautiful Turkish pouch, well filled with powder and shot. Carrying my gun, with a good warm cloak over my uniform, and with a large bag containing all my purchases, I take leave of the worthy Greek, and am landed on the shore, determined on obtaining a lodging from the cheating papa, by fair means or foul. The good wine of my friend the Cephalonian had excited me just enough to make me carry my determination into immediate execution. I had in my pockets four or five hundred copper gazette, which were very heavy, but which I had procured from the Greek, foreseeing that I might want them during my stay on the island. I store my bag away in the barn, and I proceed, gun in hand, towards the house of the priest. The church was closed. I must give my readers some idea of the state I was in at that moment. I was quite hopeless. The three or four hundred sequins I had with me did not prevent me from thinking that I was not in very great security on the island. I could not remain long. I would soon be found out and being guilty of desertion, I would be treated accordingly. I did not know what to do, and that is always an unpleasant predicament. It would be absurd for me to return to Corfu of my own accord. My flight would be then be useless. I should be thought a fool, for my return would be a proof of cowardice or stupidity. Yet I did not feel the courage to desert altogether. The chief reason of my decision was not that I had a thousand sequins in the hands of the faro banker, or my well-stocked wardrobe, or the fear of not getting a living somewhere else, but the unpleasant recollection that I should leave behind me a woman whom I loved to adoration, and for whom I had not yet obtained any favor, not even of kissing her hand. In such distress of mind I could not do anything else but abandon myself to chance. Whatever the reason might be, and the most essential thing for the present was to secure a lodging and my daily food. I knock at the door of the priest's dwelling. He looks out of a window and shuts it without listening to me. I knock again, I swear, I call out loudly, all in vain. Giving way to my rage, I took aim at the poor sheep grazing with several others at a short distance and kill it. The herdsman begins to scream. The papa shows himself at the window, calling out, Thieves! Murder! and orders the alarm bell to be rung. Three bells are immediately set in motion. I foresee a general gathering. What is going to happen? I do not know. What will happen what will, I load my gun and wait the coming events. In less than eight or ten minutes, I see a crowd of peasants coming down the hills, armed with guns, pitchforks, or cudgels. I withdraw inside the barn, but without the slightest fear, for I cannot suppose that, seeing me alone, these men will murder me without listening to me. The first ten or twelve peasants come forward, gun in hand and ready to fire. I stop them by throwing down my gazette, which they lose no time in picking up from the ground, and I keep on throwing money down as the men came forward, until I had no more left. The clowns were looking at each other in great astonishment, not knowing what to make out of a well-dressed young man, looking very peaceful and throwing his money to them with such generosity. I could not speak to them until the deafening noise of the bells should cease. I quietly sit down on my large bag and keep still. But as soon as I can be heard, I begin to address the men. The priest, however, assisted by his beetle and his herdsmen, interrupts me, and all the more easily that I was speaking Italian. My three enemies, who talked all at once, were trying to excite the crowd against me. One of the peasants, an elderly and reasonable-looking man, comes up to me and asks in Italian why I have killed the sheep. To eat it, my good fellow, but not before I have paid for it but his holiness the papa might choose to charge one sequin for it. Here is one sequin. The priest takes the money and goes away. The war is over. The peasant tells me that he had served on the campaign of 1716, and that he was at the defense of Corfu. I compliment him and ask him to find me a lodging and a man able to prepare my meals. He answers that he will procure me a whole house, that he will be the cook himself, but I must go up the hill. No matter. He calls two stout fellows, one takes my bag, the other shoulders my sheep, and forward. As we are walking along, I tell him, My good man, I would like to have in my service twenty-four fellows, like these under military discipline, 
I would give each man twenty gazzette a day, and I would have forty as my lieutenant. "I will," says the old soldier, "raise for you this very day a body guard of which you will be proud." We reach a very convenient house, containing on the ground floor three rooms and a stable, which I immediately turned into a guard room. My lieutenant went to get what I wanted, and particularly a needlewoman to make me some shirts. In the course of the day I had furniture, bedding, kitchen utensils, a good dinner, twenty four well equipped soldiers, a superannuated seamstress, and several young girls to make my shirts. After supper I found my position highly pleasant, being surrounded with some thirty persons, who looked upon me as their sovereign, although they could not make out what had brought me to their island. The only thing which struck me as disagreeable was that the young girls could not speak Italian, and I did not know Greek enough to enable me to make love to them. The next morning my lieutenant had the guard relieved, and I could not help bustling into a merry laugh. They were like a flock of sheep, all fine men, well made and strong, but without uniform and without discipline, the finest band is all but a herd. However, they quickly learned how to present arms and to obey the orders of their officer. I ordered three sentinels to be placed, one before the guard room, one at my door, and a third where he could have a good view of the sea. This sentinel was to give me warning of the approach of any armed boat or vessel. For the first two or three days I considered all this as mere amusement, but thinking that I might really want the men to repel force by force, I had some idea of making my army take an oath of allegiance. I did not do so, however, although my lieutenant assured me that I had only to express my wishes, for my generosity had captured the love of all the islanders. My seamstress, who had procured some young needlewomen to sew my shirts, had expected that I would fall in love with one, and not with all, but my amorous zeal overstepped her hopes, and all the pretty ones had their turn, and they were all well satisfied with me. The seamstress was rewarded for her good offices. I was leading a delightful life, for my table was supplied with excellent dishes, juicy mutton, and snipe so delicious that I have never tasted their like except in St. Petersburg. I drank scopolo wine, or the best muscatel of the archipelago. My lieutenant was my only table companion. I never took a walk without him, and two of my bodyguard, in order to defend myself against the attacks of a few young men, who had a spite against me because they fancied, not without some reason, that my needlewomen, their mistress, had left them on my account. I often thought, while I was rambling about the island, that without money I should have been unhappy, and that I was indebted to my gold for all the happiness that I was enjoying. But it was right to suppose, at the same time, if I had not left my purse pretty heavy, I would not have been likely to leave Corfu. I had thus been playing the petty king with success for a week or ten days, when, towards ten o'clock at night, I heard the sentinel's challenge. My lieutenant went out, and returned announcing that an honest-looking man who spoke Italian wished to see me on important business. I brought him in, and in the presence of my lieutenant he told me in Italian, Next Sunday, the Papa, del Dimopolo, will fulminate against you, the Cata Romanacchia. If you do not prevent him, a slow fever will send you into the next world in six weeks. I have never heard of such a drug. It is not a drug, it is a curse pronounced by a priest with the host in his hands, and is sure to be fulfilled. What reason can that priest have to murder me? You disturb the peace and discipline of his parish. You have seduced several young girls, and now their lovers refuse to marry them. I made him drink, and thanking him heartily, wished him good night. His warning struck me as deserving my attention, for, if I had no fear of the Cata Romanacchia, in which I had not the slightest faith, I feared certain poisons by which they might be far more efficient. I passed a very quiet night, but at daybreak I got up, and without saying anything to my lieutenant, I went straight to the church where I found the priest, and addressed him in the following words, uttered in a tone, likely to enforce conviction. On the first symptom of fever, I will shoot you like a dog. Throw over me a curse which will kill me instantly, or make your will. Farewell. Having thus warned him, I returned to my royal palace. Early on the following Monday, the papa called on me. I had a slight headache. He inquired after my health, and when I told him that my head felt rather heavy, he made me laugh by the air of anxiety with which he assured me that it could be caused by nothing else than the heavy atmosphere of the island of Casopo. 
Three days after his visit, the advanced sentinel gave the war cry. The lieutenant went out to reconnoitre, and after a short absence he gave me notice that the long boat of an armed vessel had just landed an officer. Danger was at hand. I go out myself. I call my men to arms, and, advancing a few steps, I see an officer, accompanied by a guide, who was walking towards my dwelling. As he was alone, I had nothing to fear. I returned to my room, giving orders to my lieutenant to receive him with all military honors, and to introduce him. Then, girding my sword, I waited for my visitor. In a few minutes, adjunctant Minolto, the same who had brought me the order to put myself under arrest, makes his appearance. You are alone, I say to him, and therefore you come as a friend. Let us embrace. I must come as a friend, for, as an enemy, I should not have enough men. But what I see seems a dream. Take a seat and dine with me. I will treat you splendidly. Most willingly, and after dinner we will leave the island together. You may go alone if you like, but I will not leave this place until I have the certainty, not only that I should not be sent to the Bastarda, but also that I shall have every satisfaction from the knave whom the general ought to send to the galleys. Be reasonable, and come with me of your own accord. My orders are to take you by force, but as I have not enough men to do so, I shall make my report, and the general will, of course, send a force sufficient to arrest you. Never. I will not be taken alive. You must be mad. Believe me, you are in the wrong. You have disobeyed the order I brought you to go to the Bastarda, and in that you acted wrongly. And in that alone, for in every other respect you were perfectly right, the general himself says so. Then I ought to have put myself under arrest? Certainly. Obedience is necessary in our profession. Would you have obeyed if you had been in my place? I cannot and will not tell you what I would have done, but I know that if I had disobeyed orders I should be guilty of a crime. But if I surrendered now, I should be treated like a criminal, and much more severely than if I had obeyed that unjust order. I think not. Come with me, and you will know everything. What? Go, without knowing what fate may be in store for me? Do not expect it. Let us have dinner. If I am guilty of such a dreadful crime that violence must be used against me, I will surrender only to irresistible force. I cannot be worse off, but there may be blood spilled. You are mistaken. Such conduct would only make you more guilty. But I say, like you, let us have dinner. A good meal will very likely render you more disposed to listen to reason. Our dinner was nearly over when we heard some noise outside. The lieutenant came in and informed me that the peasants were gathering in the neighborhood of my house to defend me, because a rumor had spread through the island that the felucca had been sent with orders to arrest me and to take me to Corfu. I told him to undeceive the good fellows and to send them away, but to give them first a barrel of wine. The peasants went away satisfied, but to show their devotion at me they all fired their guns. It is all very amusing, said the adjutant but it will turn out very serious if you let me go away alone, for my duty compels me to give an exact account of all I have witnessed. I will follow you if you give me your word of honor to land me free in Corfu. I have orders to deliver you to the person of Monsieur Foscari on board the Bastarda. Well, you should not execute your orders this time. If you do not obey the commands of the general, his honor will compel him to use violence against you, and of course he can do it. But tell me, what would you do if the general should leave you in this island for the sake of the joke? There is no fear of that, however, and after the report which I must give, the general will certainly make up his mind to stop the affair without shedding blood. Without a fight, it will be difficult to arrest me, for with five hundred peasants in such a place as this, I would not be afraid of three thousand men. One man will prove enough, you will be treated as a leader of rebels. All these peasants may be devoted to you, but they cannot protect you against one man who will shoot you for the sake of earning a few pieces of gold. I can tell you more than that. Amongst all those men who surround you, there is not one who would not murder you for twenty sequins. Believe me. Go with me. Come to enjoy the triumph which is awaiting for you in Corfu. You will be courted and applauded. You will narrate yourself all your mad frolics. People will laugh and at the same time will admire you for having listened to reason the moment I came here. 
everybody feels esteem for you, and M. D R thinks a great deal of you. He praises very highly the command you have shewn over your passion, in refraining from thrusting your sword through that insolent fool, in order not to forget the respect you owe to his house. The general himself must esteem you, for he cannot forget what you told him of that knave. What has become of him? Four days ago, Major Sardina's frigate arrived with dispatches, in which the general must have found all the proof of the imposture, for he caused the fake duke or prince to disappear very suddenly. Nobody knows where he has been sent to, and nobody ventures to mention the fellow before the general, for he has made the most egregious blunder respecting him. But was the man received in society after the thrashing I gave him? God forbid! Do you not recollect that he wore a sword? From that moment no one would receive him. His arm was broken, and his jaw shattered to pieces. But in spite of the state he was in, in spite of what he must have suffered, his excellency had him removed a week after you treated him so severely. But your flight is what everyone has been wondering over. It was thought for three days that Monsieur D. R. had concealed you in his house, and he was openly blamed for doing so. He had to declare loudly at the general's table that he was in the most complete ignorance of your whereabouts. His Excellency even expressed his anxiety about your escape, and it was only yesterday that your place of refuge was made known by a letter addressed by the priest of this island to the protopapa Bulgari, in which he complained that an Italian officer had invaded the island of Casopo a week before, and had committed unheard of violence. He accused you of seducing all the girls, and of threatening to shoot him if he dares to pronounce Cateromanachia against you. This letter, which was read publicly in the evening reception, made the general laugh, but he ordered me to arrest you all the same. Madame Sagredo was the cause of all of it. True, but she is well punished for it. You ought to call upon her with me tomorrow. Tomorrow? Are you then certain I shall not be placed under arrest? Yes, for I know that the general is a man of honor. I am of the same opinion. Let us go on board your felucca. We will embark together after midnight. Well, why not now? Because I will not run the risk of spending the night on board Monsieur Foscari's Bastarda. I want to reach Corfu by daylight, so as to make your victory more brilliant. But what shall we do for the next eight hours? We will pay a visit to some beauties of a species unknown in Corfu, and have a good supper. I ordered my lieutenant to send plenty to eat and to drink to the men on board the felucca to prepare a splendid supper, and to spare nothing, as I should leave the island at midnight, I made him a present of all my provisions, except such as I wanted to take with me. These I sent on board. My janissaries, to whom I gave a week's pay, insisted upon escorting me, fully equipped as far as the boat, which made the adjutant laugh all the way. We reached Corfu by eight in the morning, and we went alongside the Bastarda. The adjutant consigned me to Monsieur Foscari, assuring me that he would immediately give notice to my arrival to Monsieur D. R., send my luggage to his house, and report the success of his expedition to the general. Monsieur Foscari, commander of the Bastarda, treated me very badly. If he had been blessed with any delicacy of feeling, he would not have been in such a hurry to put me in irons. He might have talked to me, and have thus delayed for a quarter of an hour that operation which greatly vexed me. But, without uttering a single word, he sent me to the Capo di Scalo, which made me sit down, and told me to put my foot forward to receive the irons, which, however, did not dishonor anyone in that country, not even the galley slaves, for they are better treated than soldiers. My right leg was already in irons, and the left one was in the hands of the man, for the completion of that unpleasant ceremony, when the adjutant of His Excellency came to tell the executioner to set me at liberty and to return me my sword. I wanted to present my compliments to the noble Monsieur Foscari, but the adjutant, rather ashamed, assured me that His Excellency did not expect me to do so. The first thing I did was to pay my respects to the general, without saying one word to him, but he told me, with a very serious countenance, to be more prudent for the future, and to learn that a soldier's first duty was to obey, and above all to be modest and discreet. I understood perfectly the meaning of the last two words, and acted accordingly. When I made my appearance at Monsieur D. R.'s, 
I could see pleasure on everybody's face. Those moments have always been so dear to me that I have never forgotten them. They have afforded me consolation in the times of adversity. If you would relish pleasure, you must endure pain, and delights are in proportion to the privations which we have suffered. Monsieur D. R. was so glad to see me that he came up to me and warmly embraced me. He presented me with a beautiful ring which he took from his own finger, and told me that I had acted quite rightly in not letting anyone, and particularly himself, know where I had taken refuge. But you can't think, he added frankly, how interested Madame F. was in your fate. She would be really delighted if you would call on her immediately. How delightful to receive such advice from his own lips! But the word immediately annoyed me, because, having passed the night on board the felucca, I was afraid that the disorder of my toilet might injure me in her eyes. Yet I could neither refuse Monsieur D. R., nor tell him the reasons of my refusal, and I bethought myself that I would make a merit of it in the eyes of Madame F. I, therefore, went at once to her house. The goddess was not yet visible, but her attendant told me to come in, assuring me that her mistress's bell would soon be heard, and that she would be very sorry if I did not wait to see her. I spent half an hour with that young and indiscreet person, who was a very charming girl, and learned from her many things which caused me great pleasure, and particularly all that had been said respecting my escape. I found that, throughout the affair, my conduct had met with general approbation. As soon as Madame F. had seen her maid, she desired me to be shown in. The curtains were drawn aside, and I thought I saw Aurora, surrounded with roses, and the pearls of mourning. I told her that if it had not been for the order I had received from Monsieur D. R., I would not have presumed to present myself before her in my traveling costume, and in the most friendly tone she answered that Monsieur D. R., knowing all the interest she felt in me, had been quite right to tell me to come, and she assured me that Monsieur D. R. had the greatest esteem for me. I do not know, madam, how I have deserved such great happiness, for all I have dared to aim was at toleration. We all admired the control you kept over your feelings when you refrained from killing that insolent madman on the spot. He would have been thrown out the window if he had not beat a hurried retreat. I should certainly have killed him, madam, if you had not been present. A very pretty compliment, but I can hardly believe that you thought of me in such a moment. I did not answer, but cast my eyes down, and gave a deep sigh. She observed my new ring, and, in order to change the subject of conversation, she praised Monsieur D. R. very highly, as soon as I had told her that how he had offered it to me. She desired me to give her an account of my life on the island, and I did so, but I allowed my pretty needlewoman to remain under a veil, for I had already learnt that in this world the truth must often remain untold. All my adventures amused her very much, and she greatly admired my conduct. Would you have the courage, she said, to repeat all you have just told me, and exactly in the same terms before the Provveditore Generale? Most certainly, madam, provided that he asked me himself. Well then, prepare to redeem your promise. I want our excellent general to love you, and to become your warmest protector, so as to shield you against every injustice and to promote your advancement. Leave it all to me. Her reception fairly overwhelmed me with happiness, and on leaving her house I went to Major Moroli to find out the state of my finances. I was glad to hear that after my escape he had no longer considered me a partner in the Faro Bank. I took four hundred sequins from the cashier, and, reserving the right to become again a partner, should circumstances prove at any time favorable. In the evening I made a careful toilet and called for the adjutant Minolotto, in order to pay with him a visit to Madame Sagredo, the general's favorite. With the exception of Madame F., she was the greatest beauty of Corfu. My visit surprised her, because, as she had been the cause of all that had happened, she was very far from expecting it. She imagined that I had a spite against her. I undeceived her, speaking to her very candidly, and she treated me most kindly, inviting me to come now and then to spend an evening at her house. But I neither accepted nor refused her amiable invitation, knowing that Madame F. disliked her, and how could I be a frequent guest at her house with such a knowledge? Besides, Madame Segredo was very fond of gambling, and, to please her, 
it was necessary either to lose or to make her win. But to accept such conditions, one must be in love with the lady, or to wish her conquest. I would have not the slightest idea of either. The adjutant, Minolotto, never played, but he had captivated the lady's good graces by his services in the character of Mercury. When I returned to the palace, I found Madame F. alone, Monsieur D. R. being engaged with his correspondence. She asked me to sit near her, and to tell her of my adventures in Constantinople. I did so, and I had no occasion to repent it. My meeting with Yusef's wife pleased her extremely, but the bathing scene by moonlight made her blush with excitement. I veiled as much as I could the two brilliant colors of my picture, but if she did not find me clear, she would oblige me to be more explicit, and if I made myself better understood by giving to my recital a touch of voluptuousness which I had borrowed from her looks rather than from my own recollection, she would scold me and tell me that I might have disguised a little more. I felt that the way she was talking would give her a liking for me, and I was satisfied that the man who can give birth to amorous desires is easily called upon to gratify them. It was the reward I was ardently longing for, and I dared to hope it would be mine, although I could see it only looming in the distance. It happened on that day, Monsieur D. R. had invited a large company to supper. I had, as a matter of course, to engross all conversation and to give the fullest particulars of all that had taken place from the moment I received the order to place myself under arrest, up to the time of my release from the Bastarda. Monsieur Foscari was seated next to me, and the last part of my narrative was not, I suppose, particularly agreeable to him. The account I gave of my adventures pleased everybody, and it was decided that the Provitore Generale must have the pleasure of hearing my tale from my own lips. I mentioned that hay was very plentiful in Casopo, and as that article was very scarce in Corfu, Monsieur D. R. told me that I ought to seize the opportunity of making myself agreeable to the general by informing him of that circumstance without delay. I followed his advice the very next day, and was very well received, for His Excellency immediately ordered a squad of men to go to the island and to bring large quantities of hay to Corfu. A few days later, the adjutant Minolto came to me in the coffee-house, and told me that the general wished to see me. This time, I promptly obeyed his commands. End of chapter 14, part C Chapter 15, part 1 of the Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lucy Burgoyne. The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume 1. The Venetian Years by Giacomo Casanova Episode 3 Military Career Chapter 15 Part 1 Progress of my amour My journey to Otranto I enter the service of Madame F. A fortunate excoration The room I entered was full of people His Excellency, seeing me smiled and drew upon me the attention of all his guests by saying aloud, Here comes that young man who is good judge of princes. My lord, I have become a judge of nobility by frequenting the society of men like you. The ladies are curious to know all you have done from time of your escape from Corfu up to your return. Then you sentence me, Monsignor, to make a public confession? Exactly, but as it is to be a confession, be careful not to admit the most insignificant circumstance, and suppose that I am not in the room. On the contrary, I wish to receive absolution only from Your Excellency, but my history will be a long one. If such is the case, your confessor gives you permission to be seated. 
I gave all the particulars of my adventures, with the exception of my dalliance with the nymphs of the island. "'Your story is a very instructive one,' observed the general. "'Yes, my lord, for the adventures show that a young man is never so near his utter ruin, than when, excited by some great passion, he finds himself able to minister to it thanks to the gold in his purse. I was preparing to take my leave when the Major Domo came to inform me that His Excellency desired me to remain to supper. I had therefore the honour of a seat at his table, but not the pleasure of eating, for I was obliged to answer the questions addressed to me from all quarters, and I could not contrive to swallow a single mouthful. I was seated next to the proto-papa Belgari, and I entreated his pardon for having ridiculed Deldemo Polo's oracle. It is nothing else but regular cheating, he said, but it is very difficult to put a stop to it. It is an old custom. A short time afterwards, Madame F. whispered a few words to the general, who turned to me and said, that he would be glad to hear me relate what had occurred to me in Constantinople, with the wife of the Turk Yusuf, and at another friend's house, where I had seen bathing by moonlight. I was rather surprised at such an invitation, and told him that such frolics were not worth listening to, and the general not pressing me no more was said about it but I was astonished at Madame F.'s indiscretion. She had no business to make my confidences public. I wanted her to be jealous of her own dignity, which I loved even more than her person. Two or three days later she said to me, Why did you refuse to tell your adventures in Constantinople before the general? because I do not wish everybody to know that you allow me to tell you such things. What I may dare, madam, to say to you when we are alone, I would certainly not say to you in public. And why not? It seems to me, on the contrary, that if you are silent in public out of respect for me, you ought to be all the more silent when we are alone. I wanted to amuse you, and have exposed myself to the danger of displeasing you, but I can assure you, madam, that I will not run such a risk again. I have no wish to pry into your intentions, but it strikes me that if your wish was to please me, you ought not to have run the risk of obtaining the opposite result. We take supper with the general this evening, and Monsieur dear R., has been asked to bring you. I feel certain that the General will ask you again for your adventures in Constantinople, and this time you cannot refuse him. Monsieur dear R. came in, and we went to the General's. I thought as we were driving along that, although Madame F. seemed to have intended to humiliate me, I ought to accept it all as a favour of fortune, because, by compelling me to explain my refusal to the general, Madame F. had, at the same time, compelled me to a declaration of my feelings, which was not without importance. The provator general gave me a friendly welcome, and kindly handed me a letter which had come with the official dispatches from Constantinople. I bowed my thanks, and put the letter in my pocket, but he told me that he was himself a great lover of news, and that I could read my letter. I opened it. It was from Yusuf, who announced the death of Count de Bonval. Hearing the name of the worthy Yusuf, the general asked me to tell him my adventure with his wife. I could not now refuse, and I began a story which amused and interested the general and his friends for an hour or so, 
but which was from beginning to end the work of my imagination. Thus I continued to respect the privacy of Yusuf, to avoid implicating the good fame of Madame F., and to show myself in a light which was tolerably advantageous to me. My story, which was full of sentiment, did me a great deal of honour, and I felt very happy when I saw from the expression of Madame F.'s face that she was pleased with me, although somewhat surprised. When we found ourselves again in her house, she told me, in the presence of Monsieur D. R., that the story I had related to the general was certainly very pretty, although purely imaginary, that she was not angry with me, because I had amused her, but that she could not help remarking my obstinacy in refusing compliance with her wishes. Then, turning to Monsieur D. R., she said, Monsieur Casanova pretends that if he had given an account of his meeting with Yusuf's wife, without changing anything, everybody would think that I allowed him to entertain me with indecent stories. I want you to give your opinion about it, will you? She added, speaking to me. Be so good as to relate immediately the adventure in the same words which you have used when you told me of it. Yes, madam, if you wish me to do so. Stung to the quick, by an indiscretion, which, as I did not yet know women thoroughly, seemed to me without example. I cast all fears of displeasing to the winds, related the adventure with all the warmth of an impassioned poet, and without disguising or attenuating in the least the desires which the charms of the Greek beauty had inspired me with. Do you think, said Monsieur D. R. to Madame F., that if he ought to have related that adventure before all our friends, as he has just related it to us, if it be wrong for him to tell it in public, it is also wrong to tell it to me in private. You are the only judge of that, yes, if he has displeased you, no, if he has amused you. As for my own opinion, here it is. He has just now amused me very much, but he would have greatly displeased me if he had related the same adventure in public. Then, exclaimed Madame F., I must request you never to tell me in private anything that you cannot repeat in public. I promise, Madame, to act always according to your wishes. It being understood, added Monsieur D. R., smiling, that Madame reserves all rights of repealing, but order whenever she may think fit. I was vexed, but I contrived not to show it. A few minutes more, and we took leave of Madame F. I was beginning to understand the charming women, and to dread the ordeal to which she would subject me. But love was stronger than fear and fortified with hope. I had the courage to endure the thorns, so as not to gather the rose at the end of my sufferings. I was particularly pleased to find that Monsieur D. R. was not jealous of me, even when she seemed to dare him to it. This was a point of the greatest importance. A few days afterwards, as I was entertaining her on various subjects, she remarked how unfortunate it had been for me to enter the lazaretto at Ancona without any money. In spite of my distress, I said, I fell in love with a young and beautiful Greek slave, who very nearly contrived to make me break through all the sanitary laws. How so? You are alone, madam, and I have not forgotten your orders. Is it a very improper story? No, yet I would not relate it to you in public. Well, she said laughing, I repeal my order. 
as M. D. R. said I would. Tell me all about it. I told my story, and, seeing that she was pensive, I exaggerated the misery I had felt at not being able to complete my conquest. What do you mean by your misery? I think that the poor girl was more to be pitied than you. You have never seen her since. I beg your pardon, madam. I met her again, but I dare not tell you when or how. Now you must go on. It is all nonsense for you to stop. Tell me all. I expect you have been guilty of some black deed. Very far from it, madam, for it was a very sweet, although incomplete, enjoyment. Go on, but do not call things exactly by their names. It is not necessary to go into details. Emboldened by the renewal of her order, I told her, without looking her in the face, of my meeting with the Greek slave in the presence of Bellino, and of the act which was cut short by the appearance of her master. When I had finished my story, Madame F. remained silent, and I turned the conversation into a different channel, for though I felt myself on an excellent footing with her, I knew likewise that I had to proceed with great prudence. She was too young to have lowered herself before, and she would certainly look upon a connection with me as lowering of her dignity. Fortune, which had always smiled upon me in the most hopeless cases, did not intend to ill-treat me on this occasion, and procured me, on that very same day, a favour of a very peculiar nature. My charming lady-love, having pricked her finger rather severely, screamed loudly, and stretched her hand towards me, entreating me to suck the blood flowing from the wound. You may judge, dear reader, whether I was long in seizing that beautiful hand, and if you are, or if you have ever been in love, you will easily guess the manner in which I performed my delightful work. What is a kiss? Is it not an ardent desire to inhale a portion of the being we love? Was not the blood I was sucking from that charming wound a portion of the woman I worshipped? When I had completed my work, she thanked me affectionately, and told me to spit out the blood I had sucked. Is it here, I said, placing my hand on my heart, and God alone knows what happiness it has given me. You have drunk my blood with happiness. Are you then a cannibal? I believe not, madam, but it would have been sacrilege in my eyes if I had suffered one single drop of your blood to be lost. One evening there was an unusually large attendance at Monsieur D'Ars assembly and we were talking of the carnival which was near at hand. Everybody was regretting the lack of actors, and the impossibility of enjoying the pleasures of the theatre. I immediately offered to procure a good company at my expense, if the boxes were at once subscribed for, and the monopoly of the Faro Bank granted to me. No time was to be lost for the carnival was approaching, and I had to go to Otranto to engage a troop. My proposal was accepted with great joy, and the Provator General placed a felucca at my disposal. The boxes were all taken in three days, and a Jew took the pit, two nights a week accepted, which I reserved for my own profit. The carnival being very long that year, I had every chance of success. It is said generally that the profession of theatrical manager is difficult, but if that is the case, I have not found it so by experience, and am bound to affirm the contrary. I left Corfu in the evening, and having a good breeze in my favour, I reached Otranto by daybreak the following morning 
without the oarsmen having had to row a stroke. The distance from Corfu to Otranto is only about fifteen leagues. I had no idea of landing, owing to the quarantine which is always enforced for any ship or boat coming to Italy from the east. I only went to the parlour of the lazaretto, where, placed behind a grating, you can speak to any person who calls, and who must stand behind another grating placed opposite, at a distance of six feet. As soon as I announced that I had come for the purpose of engaging a troupe of actors to perform in Corfu, the managers of the two companies, then in Otranto, came to the parlour to speak to me. I told them at once that I wished to see all the performers, one company at a time. The two rival managers gave me then a very comic scene, each manager wanting the other to bring his troop first. The harbour master told me that the only way to settle the matter was to say myself which of the two companies I would see first. One was from Naples, the other from Sicily. Not knowing either, I gave the preference to the first. Don Fastidio, the manager, was very vexed, while Batty Paglia, the director of the second, was delighted because he hoped that, after seeing the Neapolitan troop, I would engage his own. An hour afterwards, Fastidio returned with all his performance, and my surprise may be imagined when amongst them I recognized Petronio and his sister, Marina, who, the moment she saw me, screamed for joy, jumped over the grating, and threw herself in my arms. A terrible hubbub followed, and high words passed between Fastidio and the harbour master. Marina being in the service of Fastidio, the captain compelled him to confine her to the lazaretto, where she would have to perform quarantine at his expense. The poor girl cried bitterly, but I could not remedy her imprudence. I put a stop to the quarrel by telling Fastidio to show me all his people, one after the other. Petronio belonged to his company and performed the lovers. He told me that he had a letter for me from Therese. I was also glad to see a Venetian of my acquaintance who played the pantaloon in the pantomime. Three tolerably pretty actresses a Palsanella and a Scaramouche. Altogether, the troupe was a decent one. I told Fastidio to name the lowest salary he wanted for all his company, assuring him that I would give the preference to his rival if he should ask me too much. Sir, he answered, we are twenty and shall require six rooms with ten beds one sitting room for all of us, and thirty Neapolitan ducats a day, all travelling expenses paid. Here is my stock of plays, and we will perform those that you may choose. Thinking of poor Marina, who would have to remain in the lazaretto before she could reappear on the stage at Otranto, I told Fastidio to get the contract ready as I wanted to go away immediately. I had scarcely pronounced these words the war broke out again between the manager-elect and his unfortunate competitor. Battipaglia, in his rage, called Marina a harlot and said that she had arranged beforehand with Fastidio to violate the rules of the lazaretto in order to compel me to choose their troops. Petronio, taking his sister's part, joined Fastidio, and the unlucky Battipaglia was dragged outside and treated to a generous dose of blows and fisticuffs, which was not exactly the thing to console him for a lost engagement. Soon afterwards, Petronio brought me Teresa's letter. She was ruining the Duke. 
getting rich accordingly, and waiting for me in Naples. Everything being ready towards evening, I left Otranto with twenty actors, and six large trunks containing their complete wardrobes. A light breeze which was blowing from the south might have carried us to Corfu in ten hours, but when we had sailed about one hour, my Kaobokri informed me that he could see by the moonlight a ship which might prove to be Corsair and get hold of us. I was unwilling to risk anything, so I ordered them to lower the sails and return to Otranto. At daybreak we sailed again, with a good westerly wind, which would also have taken us to Corfu. But after we had gone two or three hours, the captain pointed out to me a brigantine, evidently a pirate, for she was shaping her course so as to get to windward of us. I told him to change the course, and to go by starboard, to see if the brigantine would follow us, but she immediately imitated our manoeuvre. I could not go back to Otranto, and I had no wish to go to Africa, so I ordered the men to shape our course, so as to land on the coast of Calabria, by hard rowing and at the nearest point. The sailors, who were frightened to death, communicated their fears to my comedians, and soon I heard nothing but weeping and sobbing. Every one of them was calling earnestly upon some saint, but not one single prayer to God did I hear. The bewailings of Scaramouche, the dull and spiritless despair of Fastidio, offered a picture which would have made me laugh heartily if the danger had been imaginary and not real. Marina alone was cheerful and happy because she did not realize the danger we were running, and she laughed at the terror of the crew and of her companions. End of chapter 15, part 1《ジャック・キャサノーヴァ》Chapter 15, Part 2 of the Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lucy Burgoyne. The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume 1. The Venetian Years by Giacomo Casanova Episode 3 Military Career Chapter 15 Part 2 A strong breeze sprung up towards evening, so I ordered them to clap on all sail and scud before the wind, even if it should get stronger. In order to escape the pirate, I had made up my mind to cross the gulf. We took the wind through the night, and in the morning we were eighty miles from Corfu, which I determined to reach by rowing. We were in the middle of the gulf, and the sailors were worn out with fatigue, but I had no longer any fear. A gale began to blow from the north, and in less than an hour it was blowing so hard that we were compelled to sail close to the wind in a fearful manner. The felucca looked every moment as if it must capsize. Every one looked terrified, but kept complete silence, for I had enjoined it on penalty of death. In spite of our dangerous position, I could not help laughing when I heard the sobs of the cowardly scaramouche. The helmsman was a man of great nerve, and the gale being steady, I felt we would reach Curfew without mishap. At daybreak we sighted the town, and at nine in the morning we landed at Mandrachia. Everybody was surprised to see us arrive that way. As soon as my company was landed, the young officers naturally came to inspect the actresses, but they did not find them very desirable, with the exception of Marina 
who received uncomplainingly the news that I could not renew my acquaintance with her. I felt certain that she would not lack admirers, but my actresses, who had appeared ugly at the landing, produced a very different effect on the stage, and particularly the pantaloon's wife. Monsieur Duodeau, commander of a man of war, called upon her, and finding Master Pantaloon intolerant on the subject of his better half, gave him a few blows with his cane. Fastidio informed me the next day that the Pantaloon and his wife refused to perform any more, but I made them alter their mind by giving them a benefit night. The Pantaloon's wife was much applauded, but she felt insulted because, in the midst of the applause, the pit called out, Bravo, do I do. She presented herself to the general in his own box, in which I was generally, and complained of the manner in which she was treated. The general promised her, in my name, another benefit night for the close of the carnival, and I was, of course, compelled to ratify his promise. The fact is that, to satisfy the greedy actors, I abandoned to my comedians, one by one, the seventeen nights I had reserved for myself. The benefit I gave to Marina was at the special request of Madame F., who had taken her into great favour since she had had the honour of breakfasting alone with Monsieur D. R. in a villa outside of the city. My generosity cost me four hundred sequins, but the Faro Bank brought me a thousand and more. Although I never held the cards, my management at the theatre taking up all my time, my manner with the actresses gave me great kindness. It was clearly seen that I carried on no intrigue with any of them, although I had every facility for doing so. Madame F. complimented me, saying that she had not entertained such a good opinion of my discretion. I was too busy through the carnival to think of love, even of the passion which filled my heart. It was only at the beginning of Lent, and after the departure of the comedians, that I could give rein to my feelings. One morning Madame F. sent a messenger who, summoned me to her presence. It was eleven o'clock. I immediately went to her and inquired what I could do for her service. I wanted to see you, she said, to return the two hundred sequins which you lent me so nobly. Here they are. Be good enough to give me back my note of hand. Your note of hand, madam, is no longer in my possession. I have deposited it in a sealed envelope with the notary who, according to this receipt of his, can return it only to you. Why did you not keep it yourself? Because I was afraid of losing it, or of having it stolen, and in the event of my death I did not want such a document to fall into any other hands but yours. A great proof of your extreme delicacy, certainly, but I think you ought to have reserved the right of taking it out of the notary's custody yourself. I did not foresee the possibility of calling for it myself. Yet it was a very likely thing. Then I can send word to the notary to transmit it to me. Certainly, madam, you alone can claim it. She sent to the notary, who brought the himself. She tore the envelope open, and found only a piece of paper besmeared with ink, quite ineligible, except her own name, which had not been touched. You have acted, she said, most nobly, but you must agree with me that I cannot be certain that this piece of paper is really my note of hand, although I see my name on it. True, madam, and if you are not certain of it, I confess myself 
in the wrong. I must be certain of it, and I am so, but you must grant that I could not swear to it. Granted, madam. During the following days it struck me that her manner towards me was singularly altered. She never received me in her dishabille, and I had to wait with great patience until her maid had entirely dressed her before being admitted into her presence. If I related any story, any adventure, she pretended not to understand, and affected not to see the point of an antidote or a jest. Very often she would purposely not look at me, and then I was sure to relate badly. If Monsieur D. R. laughed at something I had just said, she would ask what he was laughing for, and when he had told her, she would say it was insipid or dull. If one of her bracelets became unfastened, I offered to fasten it again, but either she would not give me so much trouble, or I did not understand the fastening, and the maid was called to do it. I could not help showing my vexation, but she did not seem to take the slightest notice of it. If Monsieur D. R. excited me to say something amusing or witty, and I did not speak immediately, she would say that my budget was empty, laughing and adding that the wit of poor Monsieur Casanova was worn out. Full of rage, I would plead guilty by my silence to her taunting accusation but I was thoroughly miserable, for I did not see any cause for that extraordinary change in her feelings. Being conscious that I had not given her any motive for it, I wanted to show her openly my indifference and contempt, but whenever an opportunity offered, my courage would forsake me, and I would let it escape. One evening, Monsieur D. R., asking me whether I had often been in love, I answered, Three times, my lord, and always happily, of course, always unhappily, the first time, perhaps, being because an ecclesiastic, I durst not to speak openly of my love, the second, because a cruel, unexpected event compelled me to leave the woman I loved at the very moment in which my happiness would have been complete. The third time, because of the feeling of pity with which I inspired the beloved object, induced her to cure me of my passion, instead of crowning my felicity. But what specific remedies did she use to effect your cure? She has ceased to be kind. I understand she has treated you cruelly, and you call that pity, do you? You are mistaken. Certainly, said Madame F., a woman may pity the man she loves, but she would not think of ill-treating him to cure him of his passion. That woman has never felt any love for you. I cannot, I will not believe it, Madame. But are you cured? Oh, thoroughly, for when I happen to think of her, I feel nothing but indifference and coldness, but my recovery was long. Your convalescence lasted, I suppose, until you fell in love with another. With another, madam, I thought I had just told you that the third time I loved was the last. A few days after that conversation, Monsieur D. R. told me that Madame F. was not well, that he could not keep her company, and that I ought to go to her, as he was sure she would be glad to see me. I obeyed, and told Madame F. what Monsieur D. R. had said. She was lying on a sofa. Without looking at me, she told me she was feverish, and would not ask me to remain with her, because I would feel weary. I could not experience any weariness in your society, madam. At all events, I can leave you only by your express command, and in that case 
I must spend the next four hours in your ante-room, for Monsieur D'R. has told me to wait for him here. If so, you must take a seat. Her cold and distant manner repelled me, but I loved her, and I had never seen her so beautiful. A slight fever animating her complexion, which was then truly dazzling in its beauty. I kept where I was, dumb and as motionless as a statue, for a quarter of an hour. Then she rang for her maid, and asked me to leave her alone for a moment. I was called back soon after, and she said to me, What has become of your cheerfulness? If it has disappeared, madam, it can only be by your will. Call it back, and you will see it return in force. What must I do to obtain that result? Only be towards me as you were when I returned from Casa Poe. I have been disagreeable to you for the last four months, and as I do not know why, I feel deeply grieved. I am always the same. In what do you find me changed? Good heavens, in everything except in beauty. But I have taken my decision. And what is it? To suffer in silence without allowing any circumstance to alter the feeling with which you have inspired me, to wish ardently to convince you of my perfect obedience to your commands, to be ever ready to give you fresh proofs of my devotion. I thank you, but I cannot imagine what you can have to suffer in silence on my account. I take an interest in you, and I always listen with pleasure to your adventures. As a proof of it, I am extremely curious to hear the history of your three loves. I invented on the spot three purely imaginary stories, making a great display of tender sentiments and of ardent love, but without alluding to amorous enjoyment, particularly when she seemed to expect me to do so. Sometimes delicacy, sometimes respect of duty, interfered to prevent the crowning pleasure, and I took care to observe, at such moments of disappointment, that a true lover does not require that all-important item to feel perfectly happy. I could easily see that her imagination was travelling farther than my narrative and that my reserve was agreeable to her. I believed I knew her nature well enough to be certain that I was taking the best road to induce her to follow me where I wished to lead her. She expressed a sentiment which moved me deeply, but I was careful not to show it. We were talking of my third love, of the woman who, out of pity, had undertaken to cure me, and she remarked, If she truly loved you, she may have wished not to cure you, but to cure herself. On the day following this partial reconciliation, Monsieur F., her husband, begged my commanding officer, D.R., to let me go with him to Butintro for an excursion of three days, his own adjutant being seriously ill. But intro is seven miles from Kerfu, almost opposite to that city. It is the nearest point to the island from the mainland. It is not a fortress, but only a small village of Epirus or Albania, as it is now called, and belonging to the Venetians. Acting on the political axiom that neglected right is lost right. The Republic sends every year four galleys to that intro, with a gang of galley slaves to fell trees, cut them and load them on the galleys, while the military keep a sharp lookout to prevent them from escaping to Turkey and becoming Muslims. One of the four galleys were commanded by Monsieur F., who, wanting an adjutant for the occasion, chose me. I went with him, 
and on the fourth day we came back to Corfu, with a large provision of wood. I found Monsieur D. R. alone on the terrace of his palace. It was Good Friday. He seemed thoughtful, and, after a silence of a few minutes, he spoke the following words, which I can never forget. Monsieur F whose adjutant died yesterday, has just been entreating me to give you to him until he can find another officer. I have told him that I had no right to dispose of your person, and that he ought to apply to you, assuring him that, if you asked me to leave to go with him, I would not raise any objection, although I require two adjutants. Has he not mentioned the matter to you? No, Monsignor. He has only tendered me his thanks for having accompanied him to Batintro. Nothing else. He is sure to speak to you about it. What do you intend to say? Simply that I will never leave the service of your excellency without your express command to do so. I never will give you such an order. As Monsieur D. R. was saying the last word, Monsieur and Madame F. came in. Knowing that the conversation would most likely turn upon the subject which had just been broached, I hurried out of the room. In less than a quarter of an hour I was sent for, and Monsieur F. said to me confidentially, Well, Monsieur Casanova, would you not be willing to live with me as my adjutant? Does His Excellency dismiss me from his service? Not at all, observed Monsieur D. R., but I leave you the choice. My lord, I could not be guilty of ingratitude, and I remain there standing, uneasy, keeping my eyes on the ground, not even striving to conceal my mortification which was, after all, very natural in such a position. I dreaded looking at Madame F., for I knew that she could easily guess all my feelings. An instant after, her foolish husband coldly remarked that I should certainly have a more fatiguing service with him than with Monsieur D. R., and that, of course, it was more honourable to serve the general governor of the Gaules than a simple sopra committo. I was on the point of answering when Madame F. said, in a graceful and easy manner, Monsieur Casanova is right, and she changed the subject. I left the room, revolving in my mind all that had just taken place. My conclusion was that Monsieur F. had asked Monsieur D. R to let me go with him at the suggestion of his wife, or at least with her consent, and it was highly flattering to my love and to my vanity, but I was bound in honour not to accept the post, unless I had a perfect assurance that it would not be disagreeable to my present patron. I will accept, I said to myself, if Monsieur D. R. tells me positively that I shall please him by doing so. It is for Monsieur F. to make him say it. End of chapter 15, part 2all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lucy Burgoyne. The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova. Volume 1. The Venetian Years. By Giacomo Casanova. Episode 3. Military Career. Chapter 15. Part three. On the same night I had the honour of offering my arm to Madame F. 
during the procession which takes place in commemoration of the death of our Lord and Saviour, which was then attended on foot by all the nobility. I expected she would mention the matter, but she did not. My love was in despair, and through the night I could not close my eyes. I feared she had been offended by my refusal, and was overwhelmed with grief. I passed the whole of the next day without breaking my fast, and did not utter a single word during the evening reception. I felt very unwell, and I had an attack of fever, which kept me in bed on Easter Sunday. I was very weak on the Monday, and intended to remain in my room, when a messenger from Madame F. came to inform me that she wished to see me. I told the messenger not to say that he had found me in bed, and dressing myself rapidly, I hurried to her house. I entered her room, pale, looking very ill, yet she did not inquire after my health and kept silent a minute or two, as if she had been trying to recollect what she had to say to me. Ah, yes, you are aware that our adjutant is dead, and that we want to replace him. My husband, who has a great esteem for you, and feels that Monsieur D'Arc leaves you perfectly free to make your choice, has taken the singular fancy that you will come if I ask you myself to do us that pleasure. Is he mistaken? If you would come to us, you would have that room. She was pointing to a room adjoining the chamber in which she slept, and so situated that, to see her in every part of her room, I should not even inquire to place myself at the window. Monsieur D'R., she continued, will not love you less, and as he will see you here every day, he will not be likely to forget his interest in your welfare. Now, tell me, will you come or not? I wish I could, madam, but indeed I cannot. You cannot? That is singular. Take a seat, and tell me what there is to prevent you. When, in accepting my offer, you are sure to please Monsieur D'R. as well as us. If I was certain of it, I would accept immediately. But all I have heard from his lips was that he left me free to make a choice. Then you are afraid to grieve him if you come to us. It might be, and for nothing on earth. I am certain of the contrary. Will you be so good as to obtain that he says so to me himself, and then you will come? Oh, madam, that very minute! But the warmth of my exclamation might mean a great deal, and I turned my head round so as not to embarrass her. She asked me to give her her mantle to go to church, and we went out. As we were going down the stairs, she placed her ungloved hand upon mine. It was the first that she had granted me such a favour, and it seemed to me a good omen. She took off her hand, asking me whether I was feverish. Your hand, she said, is burning. When we left the church, Monsieur D'Arre's carriage happened to pass, and I assisted her to get in and as soon as she had gone, hurried to my room in order to breathe freely and to enjoy all the felicity which filled my soul, for I no longer doubted her love for me, and I knew that, in this case, Monsieur D'Arre was not likely to refuse her anything. What is love? I have read plenty of ancient verbiage on the subject. I have read likewise most of what has been said by modern writers, but neither all that has been said, nor what I have thought about it when I was young, and now that I am no longer so, nothing, in fact, can make me agree that love is a trifling vanity. It is a sort of madness, I grant that, 
but a madness over which philosophy is entirely powerless. It is a disease to which man is exposed at all times, no matter at what age, and which cannot be cured, if he is attacked by it in his old age. Love being sentiment which cannot be explained, God of all nature, bitter and sweet feeling, love, charming monster which cannot be fathomed, God who, in the midst of all the thorns with which thou plaguest us, Strew us so many roses on our path that, without thee, existence and death would be united and blended together. Two days after, Monsieur D. R. told me to go and take orders from Monsieur F. on board his galley, which was ready for a five or six days voyage. I quickly packed a few things and called for my new patron, who received me with great joy. We took our departure without seeing Madame, who was not yet visible. We returned on the sixth day, and I went to establish myself in my new home, for, as I was preparing to go to Monsieur D. R. to take his orders, after our landing, he came himself, and asking Monsieur F. and me whether we were pleased with each other, he said to me, Casanova, as you suit each other so well, you may be certain that you will greatly please me by remaining in the service of Monsieur F. I obeyed respectfully, and in less than one hour I had taken possession of my new quarters. Madame F. told me how delighted she was to see that great affair ended according to her wishes, and I answered with a deep reverence. I found myself like the salamander in the very heart of the fire, for which I had been longing so ardently. Almost constantly in the presence of Madame F., dining often alone with her, accompanying her in her walks, even when Monsieur D. R. was not with us, seeing her from my room, or conversing with her in her chamber, always reserved and attentive without pretension. The first night passed by without any change being brought about by that constant intercourse. Yet I was full of hope, and to keep up my courage I imagined that love was not yet powerful enough to conquer her pride. I expected everything from some lucky chance, which I promised myself to improve as soon as it should present itself, for I was persuaded that a lover is lost if he does not catch fortune by the forelock. But there was one circumstance which annoyed me. In public, she seized every opportunity of treating me with distinction, while when we were alone, it was exactly the reverse. In the eyes of the world I had all the appearance of a happy lover, but would rather have had less of the appearance of happiness and more of the reality. My love for her was disinterested. Vanity had no share in my feelings. One day, being alone with me, she said, You have enemies? but I silenced them last night. They are envious, madam, and they would pity me if they could read the secret pages of my heart. You could easily deliver me from those enemies. How can you be an object of pity for them, and how could I deliver you from them? They believe me happy, and I am miserable. You would deliver me from them, by ill-treating me in their presence. Then you would feel my bad treatment less than the envy of the wicked? Yes, madam, provided your bad treatment in public were compensated by your kindness when we are alone, for there is no vanity in the happiness I feel in belonging to you. Let others pity me. I will be happy on condition that others are mistaken. That's a part that I can never play. 
I would often be indiscreet enough to remain behind the curtain of the window in my room, looking at her when she thought herself perfectly certain that nobody saw her. But the liberty I was thus guilty of never proved of great advantage to me. Whether it was because she doubted my discretion or from habitual reserve, she was so particular that, even when I saw her in bed, my longing eyes never could obtain a sight of anything but her head. One day, being present in her room, while her maid was cutting off the points of her long and beautiful hair, I amused myself in picking up all those pretty bits, and put them all, one after the other, on her toilet table, with the exception of one small lock which I slipped into my pocket, thinking that she had not taken any notice of my keeping it. But the moment we were alone she told me quietly, but rather too seriously, to take out of my pocket the hair I had picked up from the floor. Thinking she was going too far, and such rigour appearing to me as cruel as it was unjust and absurd, I obeyed, but threw the hair on the toilet table with an air of supreme contempt. Sir, you forget yourself. No, madam, I do not for you might have feigned not to have observed such an innocent theft. Feigning is tiresome. Was such pretty larceny a very great crime? No crime, but it was an indication of feelings which you have no right to entertain for me. Feelings which you are at liberty not to return, madam, but which hatred or pride can alone forbid my heart to experience. If you had a heart, you would not be the victim of either of those two fearful passions, but you have only head, and it must be a very wicked head, judging by the care it takes to heap humiliation upon me. You have surprised my secret, madam. You may use it as you think proper, but in the meantime I have learned to know you thoroughly. That knowledge will prove more useful than your discovery for perhaps it will help me to become wiser. After this violent tirade I left her, and as she did not call me back, retired to my room. In the hope that sleep would bring calm, I undressed and went to bed. In such moments a lover hates the object of his love, and his heart distills only contempt and hatred. I could not go to sleep, and when I was sent for at supper time, I answered that I was ill. The night passed off without my eyes being visited by sleep, and feeling weak and low, I thought I would wait to see what ailed me, and refused to have my dinner, sending word that I was still very unwell. Towards evening I felt my heart leap for joy when I heard my beautiful lady love into my room. Anxiety, want of food and sleep, gave me truly the appearance of being ill, and I was delighted that it should be so. I sent her away very soon, by telling her with perfect indifference that it was nothing but a bad headache to which I was subject, and that repose and diet would effect a speedy cure. But at eleven o'clock, she came back with her friend, Monsieur D. R., and coming to my bed, she said affectionately, What ails you, my poor Casanova? A very bad headache, madam, which will be cured to-morrow. Why should you wait until to-morrow? You must get better at once. I have ordered a basin of broth and two new laid eggs for you. Nothing, madam, complete abstinence can alone cure me. He is right, said Monsieur D. R. I know those attacks. I shook my head slightly. Monsieur D. R., having just then turned round to examine an engraving, she took my hand, 
saying that she would like me to drink some broth, and I felt that she was giving me a small parcel. She went to look at the engraving with Monsieur D. R. I opened the parcel, but feeling that it contained hair, I hurriedly concealed it under the bedclothes. At the same moment, the blood rushed to my head with such violence that it actually frightened me. I begged for some water. She came to me with Monsieur D. R., and then were both frightened to see me so red, when they had seen me pale and weak only one minute before. Madame F. gave me a glass of water in which she put some eau de calms, which instantly acted as a violent emetic. Two or three minutes after I felt better, and asked for something to eat. Madame F. smiled. The servant came in with the broth and the eggs, and while I was eating I told the history of Pandolphin. Monsieur D. R. thought it was all a miracle, and I could read on the countenance of the charming woman love, affection, and repentance. If Monsieur D. R. had not been present, it would have been the moment of my happiness but I felt certain that I should not have long to wait. Monsieur D. R. told Madame F. that if he had not seen me so sick, he would have believed my illness to be all sham, for he did not think it possible for anyone to rally so rapidly. It is all owing to my odi calms, said Madame F., looking at me, and I will leave you my bottle. No, madam, be kind enough to take it with you, for the water would have no virtue without your presence. I am sure of that, said Monsieur D. R., so I will leave you here with your patient. No, no, he must go to sleep now. I slept all night, but in my happy dreams I was with her, and the reality itself would hardly have procured me greater enjoyment than I had during my happy slumbers. I saw I had taken a very long stride forward, for twenty-four hours of abstinence gave me the right to speak to her openly of my love, and the gift of her hair was an irrefutable confession of her own feelings. On the following day, after presenting myself before Monsieur F., I went to have a little chat with the maid, to wait until her mistress was visible, which was not long, and I had the pleasure of hearing her laugh when the maid told her I was there. As soon as I went in, without giving me time to say a single word, she told me how delighted she was to see me looking so well, and advised me to call upon Monsieur D. R. It is not only in the eyes of the lover, but also in those of every man of taste, that a woman is a thousand times more lovely at the moment she comes out of the arms of Morpheus than when she has completed her toilet. Around Madame F. more brilliant beams were blazing than around the sun when he leaves the embrace of Aura. Yet the most beautiful woman thinks as much of her toilet as the one who cannot do without it, very likely because more human creatures possess the more they want. In the order given to me by Madame F. to call on Monsieur D. R., I saw another reason to be certain of approaching happiness, for I thought that, by dismissing me so quickly, she had only tried to postpone the consummation which I might have pressed upon her, and which she could not have refused. Rich in the possession of her hair, I held a consultation with my love to decide what I ought to do with it. For Madame F., very likely to her wish to atone for the miserly sentiment which had refused me a small bit, had given me a splendid lock, full a yard and a half long, Having thought it over, 
I called upon a Jewish confectioner, whose daughter was a skilful embroiderer, and I made her embroider before me, on a bracelet of green satin, the four initial letters of our names, and make a very thin chain with the remainder. I had a piece of black ribbon added to one end of the chain, in the shape of a sliding noose, with which I could easily strangle myself if ever love should reduce me to despair, and I passed it round my neck. As I did not want to lose even the smallest particle of so precious a treasure, I cut with a pair of scissors all the small bits which were left, and devoutly gathered them together. Then I reduced them into a fine powder, and ordered the Jewish confectioner to mix the powder in my presence with a paste made of amber, sugar, vanilla, angelica, alchemies, and storax, and I waited until the comfits prepared with that mixture were ready. I had some more made with the same composition, but without any hair. I put the first in a beautiful sweetmeat box of fine crystal, and the second in a tortoise-shell box. From the day when, by giving me her hair, Madame F. had betrayed the secret feelings of her heart, I no longer lost my time in relating stories or adventures. I only spoke to her of my code, of my ardent desires. I told her that she must either banish me from her presence, or crown my happiness, but the cruel, charming woman would not accept that alternative. She answered that happiness could not be obtained by offending every moral law, and by swerving from our duties. If I threw myself at her feet to obtain by anticipation her forgiveness, for the loving violence I intended to use against her, she would repulse me more powerfully than if she had had the strength of a female Hercules, for she would say, in a voice full of sweetness and affection, My friend, I do not entreat you to respect my weakness, but be generous enough to spare me for the sake of all the love I feel for you. What? You love me, and you refuse to make me happy. It is impossible. It is unnatural. You compel me to believe that you do not love me. Only allow me to press my lips one moment upon your lips, and I ask no more. No, dearest, no. It would only excite the ardour of your desires. Shake my resolution, and we should then find ourselves more miserable than we are now. End of chapter 15, part 3Chapter 15, Part 4 of the Memoirs of Jarts Casanova, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lucy Burgle. The Memoirs of Jarts Casanova, Volume 1. The Venetian Years by Giacomo Casanova Episode 3 Military Career Chapter 15 Part 4 Thus did she every day plunge me in despair, and yet she complained that my wit was no longer brilliant in society, that I had lost that elasticity of spirits which had pleased her so much after my arrival from Constantinople, Monsieur D. R., who often jestingly waged war against me, used to say that I was getting thinner and thinner every day. Madame F. told me one day that my sickly looks were very disagreeable to her, because wicked tongues would not fail to say that she treated me with cruelty. Strange, almost unnatural thought, 
on it I composed an idol which I cannot read, even now, without feeling tears in my eyes. What? I answered. You acknowledge your cruelty towards me. You are afraid of the world guessing all your heartless rigor, and yet you continue to enjoy it. You condemn me unmercifully to the torments of Tantalus. You would be delighted to see me gay, cheerful, happy, even at the expense of a judgment by which the world would find you guilty of a supposed but false kindness towards me, and yet you refuse me even the slightest favours. I do not mind people believing anything, provided it is not true. What a contrast! Would it be possible for me not to love you, for you to feel nothing for me? Such contradictions strike me as unnatural. But you are growing thinner yourself, and I am dying. It must be so. We shall both die before long. You of consumption, I of exhausting decline, for I am now reduced to enjoying your shadow during the day, during the night, always, everywhere, except when I am in your presence. At that passionate declaration, delivered with all the ardour of an excited lover, she was surprised, deeply moved, and I thought that the happy hour had struck. I folded her in my arms and was already tasting the first fruits of enjoyment. The sentinel knocked twice. Oh, fatal mischance! I recovered my composure and stood in front of her. Monsieur D. R. made his appearance, and this time he found me in so cheerful a mood that he remained with us until one o'clock in the morning. My comforts were beginning to be the talk of our society. Monsieur D. R., Madame F., and I were the only ones who had a box full of them. I was stingy with them, and no one durst beg any from me, because I had said that they were very expensive, and that in all Corfu there was no confectioner who could make, or physician who could analyze them. I never gave one out of my crystal box, and Madame F. remarked it. I certainly did not believe them to be amorous filter, and I was very far from supposing that the addition of the hair made them taste more delicious. But a superstition, the offspring of my love, caused me to cherish them, and it made me happy to think that a small portion of the woman I worshipped was thus becoming a part of my being. Influenced, perhaps, by some secret sympathy, Madame F. was exceedingly fond of the comforts. She asserted before all her friends that they were the universal panacea, and knowing herself perfect mistress of the inventor, she did not inquire after the secret of the composition. But having observed that I gave away only the comforts which I kept in my tortoise-shell box, and that I never eat any but those from the crystal box. She one day asked me what reason I had for that. Without taking time to think, I told her that in those I kept for myself there was a certain ingredient which made the partaker love her. I do not believe it, she answered, but are they different from those I eat myself? They are exactly the same, with the exception of the ingredient I have just mentioned, which has been put only in mine. Tell me what the ingredient is. It is a secret which I cannot reveal to you. Then I will never eat any of your comforts. Saying which, she rose, emptied her box, and filled it again with chocolate drops, and for the next few days she was angry with me and avoided my company. I felt grieved, I became low-spirited, but I could not make up my mind to tell her that I was eating her hair. She inquired why I looked so sad, because you refused to take my comforts. You are master of your secret, 
and I am mistress of my diet. That is my reward for having taken you into my confidence. And I opened my box, emptied its contents in my hand, and swallowed the whole of them, saying, Two more doses like this, and I shall die mad with love for you. Then you will be revenged for my reserve. Farewell, madam. She called me back made me take a seat near her, and told me not to commit follies which would make her unhappy. But I knew how much she loved me, and that it was not owing to the effect of any drug. To prove to you, she added, that you do not require anything of the sort to be loved. Here is a token of my affection. And she offered me her lovely lips, and upon them mine remained pressed, until I was compelled to draw a breath. I threw myself at her feet, with tears of love and gratitude blinding my eyes, and told her that I would confess my crime if she would promise to forgive me. Your crime? You frighten me. Yes, I forgive you, but speak quickly and tell me all. Yes, everything. My comforts contain your hair reduced to a powder. Here on my arm, see this bracelet on which our names are written with your hair, and round my neck this chain of the same material, which will help me to destroy my life when your love fails me. Such is my crime, but I would not have been guilty of it if I had not loved you. She smiled, and, bidding me rise from my kneeling position, she told me that I was indeed the most criminal of men, and she wiped away my tears, assuring me that I should never have any reason to strangle myself with the chain. After that conversation, in which I had enjoyed the sweet nectar of my divinity's first kiss, I had the courage to behave in a very different manner. She could see the ardour which consumed me, Perhaps the same fire burned in her veins, but I abstained from any attack. What gives you, she said one day, the strength to control yourself? After the kiss which you granted to me of your own accord, I felt that I ought not to wish any favour unless your heart gave it as freely. You cannot imagine the happiness that kiss has given me. I not imagine it, you ungrateful man. Which of us has given that happiness? Neither you nor I, angel of my soul. That kiss so tender, so sweet, was the child of love. Yes, dearest, of love, the treasures of which are inexhaustible. The words were scarcely spoken when our lips were engaged in happy concert. She held me so tight against her bosom that I could not use my hands to secure other pleasures, but I felt myself perfectly happy. After that delightful skirmish, I asked her whether we were never to go any further. Never, dearest friend, never. Love is a child which must be amused with trifles. Too substantial food would kill it. I know love better than you. It requires that substantial food, and unless it can obtain it, love dies of exhaustion. Do not refuse me the consolation of hope. Hope as much as you please if it makes you happy. What should I do if I had no hope? I hope because I know you have a heart. Ah, yes, do you recollect the day when in your anger you told me that I had only a head but no heart, thinking you were insulting me grossly. Oh, yes, I recollect. How heartily I laughed when I had time to think. Yes, dearest, I have a heart, or I should not feel as happy as I feel now. Let us keep our happiness and be satisfied with it, as it is without wishing for anything else. Obedient to her wishes, but every day more deeply enamoured, 
I was in hope that nature at last would prove stronger than prejudice, and would cause a fortunate crisis. But, besides nature, fortune was my friend, and I owed my happiness to an accident. Madame F. was walking one day in the garden, leaning on Monsieur D. R. arm, and was caught by a large rose bush, and the prickly thorns left a deep cut on her leg. Monsieur D. R. bandaged the wound with his handkerchief, so as to stop the blood which was flowing abundantly, and she had to be carried home in a palanquin. In Corfu, wounds on the legs are dangerous, when they are not well attended to, and very often the wounded are compelled to leave the city to be cured. Madame F. was confined to her bed, and my lucky position in the house condemned me to remain constantly at her orders. I saw her every minute, but during the first three days visitors succeeded each other without intermission and I never was alone with her. In the evening, after everybody had gone, and her husband had retired to his own apartment, Monsieur D. R. remained another hour, and for the sake of propriety, I had to take my leave at the same time that he did. I had much more liberty before the accident, and I told her so half seriously, half jestingly. The next day, to make up for my disappointment, she contrived a moment of happiness for me. An elderly surgeon came every morning to dress her wound, during which operation her maid only was present. But I used to go in the morning, disabilled, to the girl's room and to wait there, so as to be the first to hear how my dear one was. That morning, the girl came to tell me to go in as the surgeon was dressing the wound. See whether my leg is less inflamed. To give an opinion, madam, I ought to have seen it yesterday. True, I feel great pain, and I am afraid of erysipelas. Do not be afraid, madam, said the surgeon. Keep your bed, and I answer for your complete recovery. The surgeon being busy preparing a poultice at the other end of the room, and the maid out, I inquired whether she felt any hardness in the calf of the leg, and whether the inflammation went up the limb, and naturally my eyes and my hands kept pace with my questions. I saw no inflammation, I felt no hardness, but, and the lovely patient hurriedly let the curtain fall smiling, and allowing me to take a sweet kiss, the perfume of which I had not enjoyed for many days. It was a sweet moment, a delicious ecstasy. From her mouth my lips descended to her wound, and satisfied in that moment that my kisses were the best of medicines. I would have kept my lips there if the noise made by the maid coming back had not compelled me to give up my delightful occupation. When we were left alone, burning with intense desires, I entreated her to grant happiness at least to my eyes. I felt humiliated, I said to her, by the thought that the felicity I have just enjoyed was only a theft. But supposing you were mistaken, the next day I was again present at the dressing of the wound, and as soon as the surgeon had left, she asked me to arrange her pillows, which I did at once, as if to make that pleasant office easier. She raised the bedclothes to support herself, and she thus gave me a sight of beauties which intoxicated my eyes, and I protracted the easy operation without her complaining of my being too slow. When I had done, I was in a fearful state, and I threw myself in an armchair opposite her bed, half dead, in a sort of trance. I was looking at that lovely being who, almost artless, was continually granting me greater and still great favours, 
and yet never allowed me to reach the goal for which I was so ardently longing. "'What are you thinking of?' she said. "'Of the supreme felicity I have just been enjoying. "'You are a cruel man.' "'No, I am not cruel, for if you love me, "'you must not blush for your indulgence. "'You must know, too, that, loving you passionately, "'I must not suppose that it is to be a surprise that I am indebted for my happiness in the enjoyment of the most ravishing sights. For if I owed it only to mere chance, I should be compelled to believe that any other man in my position might have had the same happiness, and such an idea would be misery to me. Let me be indebted to you for having proved to me this morning how much enjoyment I can derive from one of my senses. Can you be angry with my eyes? Yes, they belong to you. Tear them out. The next day, the moment the doctor had gone, she sent her maid out to make some purchases. Ah, she said a few minutes after, my maid has forgotten to change my chemise. Allow me to take her place. Very well but recollect that I give permission only to your eyes to take a share in the proceedings. Agreed. She unlaced herself, took off her stays and her chemise, and told me to be quick and put on the clean one. But I was not speedy enough, being too much engaged by all I could see. Give me my chemise, she exclaimed. It is there on that small table. Where? There, near the bed. Well, I will take it myself. She leaned over towards the table, and exposed almost everything I was longing for, and, turning slowly round, she handed me the chemise, which I could hardly hold, trembling all over with fearful excitement. She took pity on me. My hands shared the happiness of my eyes. I fell in her arms, our lips fastened together, and, in a voluptuous, ardent pressure, we enjoyed an amorous exhaustion, not sufficient to allay our desires, but delightful enough to deceive them for the moment. With greater control over herself than women have generally under similar circumstances, she took care to let me reach only the porch of the temple, without granting me yet a free entrance to the sanctuary. End of chapter 15, part 4。Chapter 16 of The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume 1, by Giacomo Casanova. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Harris. The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume 1, The Venetian Years, by Giacomo Casanova. Episode 4, Return to Venice. Chapter 16. The wound was rapidly healing up and I saw near at hand the moment when Madame F. would leave her bed and resume her usual avocations. The governor of the galleasses, having issued orders for a general review at Goyne, M. F. left for that place in his galley, telling me to join him there early on the following day with the felucca. I took supper alone with Madame F., and I told her how unhappy it made me to remain one day away from her. Let us make up tonight for tomorrow's disappointment, she said, and let us spend it together in conversation. Here are the keys. When you know that my maid has left me, come to me through my husband's room. I did not fail to follow her instructions to the letter, and we found ourselves alone with five hours before us. It was the month of June, and the heat was intense. She had gone to bed. I folded her in my arms. She pressed me to her bosom but, condemning herself to the most cruel torture, she thought I had no right to complain, 
if I was subjected to the same privation which she imposed upon herself. My remonstrances, my prayers, my entreaties were of no avail. Love, she said, must be kept in check with a tight hand, and we can laugh at him, since, in spite of the tyranny which we force him to obey, we succeed all the same in gratifying our desires. After the first ecstasy our eyes and lips unclose together, and, a little apart from each other, we take delight in seeing the mutual satisfaction beaming on our features. Our desires revive. She casts a look upon my state of innocence entirely exposed to her sight. She seems vexed at my want of excitement, and throwing off everything which makes the heat unpleasant and interferes with our pleasure, she bounds upon me. It is more than amorous fury, it is desperate lust. I share her frenzy, I hug her with a sort of delirium, I enjoy a felicity which is on the point of carrying me to the regions of bliss, but, at the very moment of completing the offering, she fails me, moves off, slips away, and comes back to work off my excitement with a hand which strikes me as cold as ice. Ah, thou cruel, beloved woman! Thou art burning with the fire of love, and thou deprivest thyself of the only remedy which could bring calm to thy senses. Thy lovely hand is more humane than thou art, but thou hast not enjoyed the felicity that thy hand has given me. My hand must owe nothing to thine. Come, darling light of my heart, come. Love doubles my existence in the hope that I will die again, but only in that charming retreat from which you have ejected me in the very moment of my greatest enjoyment. While I was speaking thus, her very soul was breathing forth the most tender sighs of happiness, and as she pressed me tightly in her arms, I felt that she was weltering in an ocean of bliss. Silence lasted rather a long time, but that unnatural felicity was imperfect, and increased my excitement. "'How canst thou complain,' she said tenderly, "'when it is to that very imperfection of our enjoyment that we are indebted for its continuance? I loved thee a few minutes since, now I love thee a thousand times more, and perhaps I should love thee less if thou hadst carried my enjoyment to its highest limit.' Oh, how much art thou mistaken, lovely one, how great is thy error! Thou art feeding upon sophisms, and thou leavest reality aside. I mean nature, which alone can give real felicity. Desires constantly renewed and never fully satisfied are more terrible than the torments of hell. But are not these desires happiness when they are always accompanied by hope? No, if that hope is always disappointed. It becomes hell itself, because there is no hope, and hope must die when it is killed by constant deception. Dearest, if hope does not exist in hell, desires cannot be found there either, for to imagine desires without hopes would be more than madness. Well, answer me. If you desire to be mine entirely, and if you feel the hope of it, which, according to your way of reasoning, is a natural consequence, why do you always raise an impediment to your own hope? Cease, dearest, cease to deceive yourself by absurd sophisms. Let us be as happy as it is in nature to be, and be quite certain that the reality of happiness will increase our love, and that love will find a new life in our very enjoyment. What I see proves the contrary. You are alive with excitement now, but if your desires had been entirely satisfied, you would be dead, benumbed, motionless. I know it by experience. If you had breathed the full ecstasy of enjoyment as you desired, you would have found a weak ardor only at long intervals. Ah, charming creature, your experience is but very small. Do not trust to it. I see that you have never known love. That which you call love's grave is the sanctuary in which it receives life, the abode which makes it immortal. Give way to my prayers, my lovely friend, and then you shall know the difference between love and hymen. You shall see that, if hymen likes to die in order to get rid of life, love, on the contrary, expires only to springing up again into existence, 
and hastens to revive, so as to savor new enjoyment. Let me undeceive you, and believe me when I say that the full gratification of desires can only increase a hundredfold the mutual ardor of two beings who adore each other. Well, I must believe you, but let us wait. In the meantime, let us enjoy all the trifles, all the sweet preliminaries of love. Devour thy mistress, dearest, but abandon to me all thy being. If this night is too short, we must console ourselves to-morrow by making arrangements for another one. And if our intercourse should be discovered? Do we make a mystery of it? Everybody can see that we love each other, and those who think that we do not enjoy the happiness of lovers are precisely the only persons we have to fear. We must only be careful to guard against being surprised in the very act of proving our love. Heaven and nature must protect our affection, for there is no crime when two hearts are blended in true love. Since I have been conscious of my own existence, love has always seemed to me the god of my being, for every time I saw a man I was delighted. I thought that I was looking upon one half of myself, because I felt I was made for him and he for me. I longed to be married. It was that uncertain longing of the heart which occupies exclusively a young girl of fifteen. I had no conception of love, but I fancied that it naturally accompanied marriage. You can therefore imagine my surprise when my husband, in the very act of making a woman of me, gave me a great deal of pain without giving me the slightest idea of pleasure. My imagination in the convent was much better than the reality I had been condemned to by my husband. The result has naturally been that we have become very good friends, but a very indifferent husband and wife, without any desires for each other. He has every reason to be pleased with me, for I always show myself docile to his wishes, but enjoyment not being in those cases seasoned by love, he must find it without flavor and he seldom comes to me for it. When I found out that you were in love with me, I felt delighted, and gave you every opportunity of becoming every day more deeply enamored of me, thinking myself certain of never loving you myself. As soon as I felt that love had likewise attacked my heart, I ill-treated you to punish you for having made my heart sensible. Your patience and constancy have astonished me, and have caused me to be guilty, for after the first kiss I gave you, I had no longer any control over myself. I was indeed astounded when I saw the havoc made by one single kiss, and I felt that my happiness was wrapped up in yours. That discovery flattered and delighted me, and I have found out, particularly to-night, that I cannot be happy unless you are so yourself." That is, my beloved, the most refined of all sentiments experienced by love, but it is impossible for you to render me completely happy without following in everything the laws and the wishes of nature. The night was spent in tender discussions and in exquisite voluptuousness, and it was not without some grief that at daybreak I tore myself from her arms to go to Goyne. She wept for joy when she saw that I left her without having lost a particle of my vigor, for she did not imagine such a thing possible. After that night, so rich in delights, ten or twelve days passed without giving us any opportunity of quenching even a small particle of the amorous thirst which devoured us, and it was then that a fearful misfortune befell me. One evening after supper, M. D. R., having retired, M. F. used no ceremony, and although I was present, told his wife that he intended to pay her a visit, after writing two letters which he had to dispatch early the next morning. The moment he had left the room, we looked at each other, and with one accord fell into each other's arms. A torrent of delights rushed through our souls without restraint, without reserve. But when the first ardor had been appeased, without giving me time to think or to enjoy the most complete, the most delicious victory, she drew back, repulsed me, and threw herself, panting, distracted, upon a chair near her bed. Rooted to the spot, 
astonished, almost mad, I tremblingly looked at her, trying to understand what had caused such an extraordinary action. She turned round towards me and said, her eyes flashing with the fire of love, "'My darling, we were on the brink of the precipice.' "'The precipice! Ah, cruel woman, you have killed me! I feel myself dying, and perhaps you will never see me again.' I left her in a state of frenzy, and rushed out, towards the esplanade, to cool myself, for I was choking. Any man who has not experienced the cruelty of an action like that of Madame F., and especially in the situation I found myself in at that moment, mentally and bodily, can hardly realize what I suffered, and, although I have felt that suffering, I could not give an idea of it. I was in that fearful state when I heard my name called from a window, and, unfortunately, I condescended to answer. I went near the window, and I saw, thanks to the moonlight, the famous Melula standing on her balcony. "'What are you doing there at this time of night?' I inquired. "'I am enjoying the cool evening breeze. Come up for a little while.' This Melula, of fatal memory, was a courtesan from Zamti, of rare beauty, who for the last four months had been the delight and the rage of all the young men in Corfu. Those who had known her agreed in extolling her charms. She was the talk of all the city. I had seen her often, but, although she was very beautiful, I was very far from thinking her as lovely as Madame F., putting my affection for the latter on one side. I recollect seeing in Dresden, in the year 1790, a very handsome woman who was the image of Melula. I went upstairs mechanically, and she took me to a voluptuous boudoir. She complained of my being the only one who had never paid her a visit, when I was the man she would have preferred to all others, and I had the infamy to give way, I became the most criminal of men. It was neither desire, nor imagination, nor the merit of the woman, which caused me to yield, for Melula was in no way worthy of me. No, it was weakness, indolence, and the state of bodily and mental irritation in which I then found myself. It was a sort of spite, because the angel whom I adored had displeased me by a caprice, which, had I not been unworthy of her, would only have caused me to be still more attached to her. Melula, highly pleased with her success, refused the gold I wanted to give her, and allowed me to go after I had spent two hours with her. When I recovered my composure I had but one feeling, hatred for myself and for the contemptible creature who had allured me to be guilty of so vile an insult to the loveliest of her sex. I went home the prey to fearful remorse and went to bed, but sleep never closed my eyes throughout that cruel night. In the morning, worn out with fatigue and sorrow, I got up, and as soon as I was dressed I went to M. F., who had sent for me to give me some orders. After I had returned, and had given him an account of my mission, I called upon Madame F., and finding her at her toilet, I wished her good morning observing that her lovely face was breathing the cheerfulness and the calm of happiness. But suddenly, her eyes meeting mine, I saw her countenance change, and an expression of sadness replace her looks of satisfaction. She cast her eyes down as if she was deep in thought, raised them again as if to read my very soul, and breaking our painful silence, as soon as she had dismissed her maid, she said to me, with an accent full of tenderness and of solemnity, Dear one, let there be no concealment, either on my part or on yours. I felt deeply grieved when I saw you leave me last night, and a little consideration made me understand all the evil which might accrue to you in consequence of what I had done. With a nature like yours, such scenes might cause very dangerous disorders, and I have resolved not to do again anything by halves. I thought that you went out to breathe the fresh air and I hoped it would do you good. I placed myself at my window, where I remained more than an hour without seeing a light in your room. Sorry for what I had done, loving you more than ever, I was compelled, when my husband came to my room, to go to bed with the sad conviction that you had not come home. 
This morning M. F. sent an officer to tell you that he wanted to see you, and I heard the messenger inform him that you were not yet up, and that you had come home very late. I felt my heart swell with sorrow. I am not jealous, dearest, for I know that you cannot love any one but me. I only felt afraid of some misfortune. At last, this morning, when I heard you coming, I was happy, because I was ready to show my repentance. But I looked at you, and you seemed a different man. Now I am still looking at you, and, in spite of myself, my soul reads upon your countenance that you are guilty, that you have outraged my love. Tell me at once, dearest, if I am mistaken. If you have deceived me, say so openly. Do not be unfaithful to love and to truth. Knowing that I was the cause of it, I should never forgive myself. But there is an excuse for you in my heart, in my whole being. More than once in the course of my life, I have found myself under the painful necessity of telling falsehoods to the woman I loved. But in this case, after so true, so touching an appeal, how could I be otherwise than sincere? I felt myself sufficiently debased by my crime, and I could not degrade myself still more by falsehood. I was so far from being disposed to such a line of conduct that I could not speak, and I burst out crying. What, my darling, you are weeping! Your tears make me miserable! You ought not to have shed any with me but tears of happiness and love. Quick, my beloved, tell me whether you have made me wretched. Tell me what fearful revenge you have taken on me, who would rather die than offend you. If I have caused you any sorrow, it has been in the innocence of a loving and devoted heart. My own darling angel, I never thought of revenge, for my heart, which can never cease to adore you, could never conceive such a dreadful idea. It is against my own heart that my cowardly weakness has allured me to the commission of a crime which, for the remainder of my life, makes me unworthy of you. Have you then given yourself to some wretched woman? Yes, I have spent two hours in the vilest debauchery, and my soul was present only to be the witness of my sadness, of my remorse, of my unworthiness. Sadness and remorse, oh, my poor friend! I believe it, but it is my fault. I alone ought to suffer. It is I who must beg you to forgive me. Her tears made mine flow again. Divine soul, I said, the reproaches you are addressing to yourself increase twofold the gravity of my crime. You would never have been guilty of any wrong against me if I had been really worthy of your love. I felt deeply the truth of my words. We spent the remainder of the day apparently quiet and composed, concealing our sadness in the depths of our hearts. She was curious to know all the circumstances of my miserable adventure, and, accepting it as an expiation, I related them to her. Full of kindness, she assured me that we were bound to ascribe that accident to fate, and that the same thing might have happened to the best of men. She added that I was more to be pitied than condemned, and that she did not love me less. We both were certain that we would seize the first favorable opportunity, she of obtaining her pardon, I of atoning for my crime, by giving each other new and complete proofs of our mutual ardor. But heaven in its justice had ordered differently, and I was cruelly punished for my disgusting debauchery. On the third day, as I got up in the morning, an awful pricking announced the horrid state into which the wretched Melula had thrown me. I was thunderstruck, and when I came to think of the misery which I might have caused if, during the last three days, I had obtained some new favor from my lovely mistress, I was on the point of going mad. What would have been her feelings if I had made her unhappy for the remainder of her life? Would any one, then, knowing the whole case, have condemned me if I had destroyed my own life in order to deliver myself from everlasting remorse? No, for the man who kills himself from sheer despair, thus performing upon himself the execution of the sentence he would have deserved at the hands of justice, cannot be blamed either by a virtuous philosopher or by a tolerant Christian. 
but of one thing I am quite certain. If such a misfortune had happened, I should have committed suicide. Overwhelmed with grief by the discovery I had just made, but thinking that I should get rid of the inconvenience as I had done three times before, I prepared myself for a strict diet which would restore my health in six weeks without any one having any suspicion of my illness, but I soon found out that I had not seen the end of my troubles. Melula had communicated to my system all the poisons which corrupt the source of life. I was acquainted with an elderly doctor of great experience in those matters. I consulted him, and he promised to set me to rights in two months. He proved as good as his word. At the beginning of September I found myself in good health, and it was about that time that I returned to Venice. The first thing I resolved on, as soon as I discovered the state I was in, was to confess everything to Madame F. I did not wish to wait for the time when a compulsory confession would have made her blush for her weakness, and given her cause to think of the fearful consequences which might have been the result of her passion for me. Her affection was too dear to me to run the risk of losing it through a want of confidence in her. Knowing her heart, her candor, and the generosity which had prompted her to say that I was more to be pitied than blamed, I thought myself bound to prove by my sincerity that I deserved her esteem. I told her candidly my position, and the state I had been thrown in, when I thought of the dreadful consequences it might have had for her. I saw her shudder and tremble, and she turned pale with fear, when I added that I would have avenged her by killing myself. "'Villainous, infamous Melula!' she exclaimed. And I repeated those words, but turning them against myself when I realized all I had sacrificed through the most disgusting weakness. Every one in Corfu knew of my visit to the wretched Melula, and every one seemed surprised to see the appearance of health on my countenance, for many were the victims that she had treated like me. My illness was not my only sorrow. I had others which, although of a different nature, were not less serious. It was written in the book of fate that I should return to Venice a simple ensign as when I left. The general did not keep his word, and the bastard son of a nobleman was promoted to the lieutenancy instead of myself. From that moment the military profession, the one most subject to arbitrary despotism, inspired me with disgust, and I determined to give it up but I had another still more important motive for sorrow in the fickleness of fortune which had completely turned against me. I remarked that, from the time of my degradation with Melula, every kind of misfortune befell me. The greatest of all, that which I felt most, but which I had the good sense to try and consider a favor, was that a week before the departure of the army, M. D. R. took me again for his adjutant, and M. F. had to engage another in my place. On the occasion of that change, Madame F. told me, with an appearance of regret, that in Venice we could not, for many reasons, continue our intimacy. I begged her to spare me the reasons, as I foresaw that they would only throw humiliation upon me. I began to discover that the goddess I had worshipped was, after all, a poor human being like all other women and to think that I should have been very foolish to give up my life for her. I probed in one day the real worth of her heart, for she told me, I cannot recollect in reference to what, that I excited her pity. I saw clearly that she no longer loved me. Pity is a debasing feeling which cannot find a home in a heart full of love, for that dreary sentiment is too near a relative of contempt. Since that time I never found myself alone with Madame F. I loved her still, I could easily have made her blush, but I did not do it. As soon as we reached Venice she became attached to M. F. R., whom she loved until death took him from her. She was unhappy enough to lose her sight twenty years after. I believe she is still alive. During the last two months of my stay in Corfu I learned the most bitter and important lessons. 
In after years I often derived useful hints from the experience I acquired at that time. Before my adventure with the worthless Melula, I enjoyed good health, I was rich, lucky at play, liked by everybody, beloved by the most lovely woman of Corfu. When I spoke, everybody would listen and admire my wit. My words were taken for oracles, and everyone coincided with me in everything. After my fatal meeting with the courtesan, I rapidly lost my health, my money, my credit, cheerfulness, consideration, wit, everything, even the faculty of eloquence vanished with fortune. I would talk, but people knew that I was unfortunate, and I no longer interested or convinced my hearers. The influence I had over Madame F. faded away little by little, and, almost without her knowing it, the lovely woman became completely indifferent to me. I left Corfu without money, although I had sold or pledged everything I had of any value. Twice I had reached Corfu rich and happy, twice I left it poor and miserable. But this time I had contracted debts, which I have never paid, not through want of will, but through carelessness. Rich and in good health, everyone received me with open arms. Poor and looking sick, no one showed me any consideration. With a full purse and the tone of a conqueror, I was thought witty, amusing. With an empty purse and a modest air, all I said appeared dull and insipid. If I had become rich again, how soon I would have been again accounted the eighth wonder of the world. O oh, men! O oh, fortune! Everyone avoided me as if the ill luck which crushed me down was infectious. We left Corfu towards the end of September with five galleys, two galleasses, and several smaller vessels under the command of M. Renier. We sailed along the shores of the Adriatic, towards the north of the Gulf, where there are a great many harbors, and we put in one of them every night. I saw Madame F. every evening. She always came with her husband to take supper on board our galleass. We had a fortunate voyage, and cast anchor in the harbor of Venice on the 14th of October, 1745, and, after having performed quarantine on board our ships, we landed on the 25th of November. Two months afterwards, the galleasses were set aside altogether. The use of these vessels could be traced very far back in ancient times. Their maintenance was very expensive, and they were useless. A galleass had the frame of a frigate with the rowing apparatus of the galley, and when there was no wind, five hundred slaves had to row. Before simple good sense managed to prevail and to enforce the suppression of these useless carcasses, there were long discussions in the Senate, and those who opposed the measure took their principal ground of opposition in the necessity of respecting and conserving all the institutions of olden times. That is the disease of persons who can never identify themselves with the successive improvements born of reason and experience, worthy persons who ought to be sent to China, or to the dominions of the Grand Lama, where they would certainly be more at home than in Europe. That ground of opposition to all improvements, however absurd it may be, is a very powerful one in a republic, which must tremble at the mere idea of novelty, either in important or in trifling things. Superstition has likewise a great part to play in these conservative views. There is one thing that the Republic of Venice will never alter. I mean the galleys, because the Venetians truly require such vessels to ply, in all weathers and in spite of the frequent calms, in a narrow sea, and because they would not know what to do with the men sentenced to hard labor. I have observed a singular thing in Corfu, where there are often as many as three thousand galley slaves. It is that the men who row on the galleys, in consequence of a sentence passed upon them for some crime, are held in a kind of opprobrium, whilst those who are there voluntarily are, to some extent, respected. I have always thought it ought to be the reverse, because misfortune, whatever it may be, ought to inspire some sort of respect. 
but the vile fellow who condemns himself voluntarily and as a trade to the position of a slave seems to me contemptible in the highest degree. The convicts of the Republic, however, enjoy many privileges, and are, in every way, better treated than the soldiers. It very often occurs that soldiers desert, and give themselves up to a sopracomito to become galley-slaves. In those cases, the captain who loses a soldier has nothing to do but to submit patiently, for he would claim the man in vain. The reason of it is that the Republic has always believed galley-slaves more necessary than soldiers. The Venetians may perhaps now, I am writing these lines in the year 1797, begin to realize their mistake. A galley-slave, for instance, has the privilege of stealing with impunity. It is considered that stealing is the least crime they can be guilty of, and that they ought to be forgiven for it. Keep on your guard, says the master of the galley-slave, and if you catch him in the act of stealing, thrash him, but be careful not to cripple him, otherwise you must pay me the one hundred ducats the man has cost me. A court of justice could not have a galley-slave taken from a galley without paying the master the amount he has dispersed for the man. As soon as I had landed in Venice I called upon Madame Orio, but I found the house empty. A neighbor told me that she had married the procurator Rosa, and had removed to his house. I went immediately to M. Rosa, and was well received. Madame Orio informed me that Nanette had become Countess R., and was living in Guastalla with her husband. Four years afterwards I met her eldest son, then a distinguished officer in the service of the Infante of Parma. As for Marton, the grace of heaven had touched her, and she had become a nun in the convent at Muran. Two years afterwards I received from her a letter full of unction, in which she adjured me, in the name of our Saviour and of the Holy Virgin, never to present myself before her eyes. She added that she was bound by Christian charity to forgive me for the crime I had committed in seducing her, and she felt certain of the reward of the elect, and she assured me that she would ever pray earnestly for my conversion. I never saw her again, but she saw me in 1754 as I will mention when we reach that year. I found Madame Manzoni still the same. She had predicted that I would not remain in the military profession, and when I told her that I had made up my mind to give it up, because I could not be reconciled to the injustice I had experienced, she burst out laughing. She inquired about the profession I intended to follow after giving up the army, and I answered that I wished to become an advocate. She laughed again, saying that it was too late, yet I was only twenty years old. When I called upon M. Grimani, I had a friendly welcome from him, but, having inquired after my brother Francois, he told me that he had had him confined in Fort St. André, the same to which I had been sent before the arrival of the Bishop of Martorano. "'He works for the Major there,' he said. He copies Simonetti's battle-pieces, and the Major pays him for them. In that manner he earns his living, and is becoming a good painter. But he is not a prisoner? Well, very much like it, for he cannot leave the fort. The Major, whose name is Spiridion, is a friend of Rosetta, who could not refuse him the pleasure of taking care of your brother. I felt it a dreadful curse that the fatal Rosetta should be the tormentor of all my family but I concealed my anger. "'Is my sister,' I inquired, "'still with him?' "'No, she has gone to your mother in Dresden.' This was good news. I took a cordial leave of the Abbe Grimani, and I proceeded to Fort St. André. I found my brother hard at work, neither pleased nor displeased with his position, and enjoying good health. After embracing him affectionately, I inquired what crime he had committed to be thus a prisoner. "'Ask the Major,' he said, for I have not the faintest idea. The Major came in just then, so I gave him the military salute, and asked by what authority he kept my brother under arrest. "'I am not accountable to you for my actions.' "'That remains to be seen.' 
I then told my brother to take his hat and to come and dine with me. The major laughed and said that he had no objection, provided the sentinel allowed him to pass. I saw that I should only waste my time in discussion, and I left the fort fully bent on obtaining justice. The next day I went to the war office, where I had the pleasure of meeting my dear Major Pelodoro, who was then commander of the fortress of Chiazza. I informed him of the complaint I wanted to prefer before the Secretary of War respecting my brother's arrest, and of the resolution I had taken to leave the army. He promised me that, as soon as the consent of the Secretary for War could be obtained, he would find a purchaser for my commission at the same price I had paid for it. I had not long to wait. The War Secretary came to the office, and everything was settled in half an hour. He promised his consent to the sale of my commission as soon as he ascertained the abilities of the purchaser, and Major Spiridion happened to make his appearance in the office while I was still there. The secretary ordered him rather angrily to set my brother at liberty immediately, and cautioned him not to be guilty again of such reprehensible and arbitrary acts. I went at once for my brother, and we lived together in furnished lodgings. A few days afterwards, having received my discharge and one hundred sequins, I threw off my uniform and found myself once more my own master. I had to earn my living in one way or another, and I decided for the profession of gamester. But Dame Fortune was not of the same opinion, for she refused to smile upon me from the very first step I took in the career, and in less than a week I did not possess a groat. What was to become of me? One must live, and I turned fiddler. Dr. Gotzi had taught me well enough to enable me to scrape on the violin in the orchestra of a theatre, and having mentioned my wishes to M. Grimani, he procured me an engagement at his own theatre of St. Samuel, where I earned a crown a day and supported myself while I awaited better things. Fully aware of my real position, I never showed myself in the fashionable circles which I used to frequent before my fortune had sunk so low. I knew that I was considered as a worthless fellow, but I did not care. People despised me, as a matter of course, but I found comfort in the consciousness that I was worthy of contempt. I felt humiliated by the position to which I was reduced after having played so brilliant a part in society but as I kept the secret to myself I was not degraded, even if I felt some shame. I had not exchanged my last word with Dame Fortune, and was still in hope of reckoning with her some day, because I was young, and youth is dear to Fortune. End of chapter 16